Welcome to Entrepreneur Mindset Reset, the podcast for entrepreneurs who want to learn from fellow business owners how to decrease the chaos and increase their sense of fulfillment while becoming more profitable. I'm your host, Tracy Trepesky. I'm an executive coach and consultant and leadership development expert. I'm also mom to two amazing teenagers and a menagerie of adopted furry family members. In each episode, we explore challenges, opportunities, and actionable tips to help you take control of your time and energy and improve your bottom line while staying true to your vision. You'll hear from me and my guests how we've tackled some of the pitfalls and unexpected surprises that entrepreneurship delivers. We're the real deal, and we're here to inspire and encourage you. Let's dive in. This is episode number 65 of Entrepreneur Mindset Reset. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today for a new episode of Entrepreneur Mindset Reset, the podcast where entrepreneurs just like you and me share how they master their mindset to overcome obstacles to their success. In today's episode, I am really excited to be speaking with Costa Michalidis of Innovation Bound. Costa shares that his journey to becoming an entrepreneur seems to have kind of been in his blood since he comes from a long line of entrepreneurs who got their start as builders in Greece before moving to New York and then becoming well-recognized for their high-end renovations in some of Manhattan's finest apartments. Costa helps people use creativity to solve problems and reminds us that we need to learn how to cope with the rapidly changing environment through resilience and innovation. He defines innovation as something that is uniquely new and valuable or as a process that results in something new and valuable. He says that entrepreneurs play a hugely important role in bringing new technology to the masses through innovative methods. Costa teaches us that we need to test early and often rather than, say, investing four years and $400,000 only to learn that the market is lukewarm at best to our brilliant idea or invention. We discussed how iterative development in our business and services not only creates more refined offerings in our business, but it also builds resilience within the business itself in the form of adaptability and personal resilience and adaptability in ourselves as the founder and possibly also in our teams. Costa focuses on five innovation habits and he teaches these to everyone that he works with. The first habit is test early and often. Habit number two is be ready to improvise and adapt. Three is come up with lots of ideas to go beyond your regular thinking and problem solving. Four is give and receive feedback as a way to improve your ideas. And five, make sure you ask the right questions. You won't want to miss when he takes time to teach us about number three, which is coming up with lots of ideas to go beyond your regular thinking and problem solving. Also, I normally don't promote like products. I am definitely not in getting kickbacks for this, but I think this is a really interesting thing to check out. Um, He's sharing a reduced price resource in his Innovation 101 course. And for the time being, it's priced at $35. So if you're wanting to dive deeper into your own innovation after listening to this podcast and listening to how Costa and his company approach innovation and learning and growing, I strongly recommend that you take advantage of this opportunity. 35 bucks is great, right? So you can do that link in the show notes as well, but go to innovationbound.com forward slash 101. I know you're going to enjoy learning from Costa today, and I suspect that you'll want to scroll down and follow the links in the show notes so you can go down many, many rabbit holes of innovation. So you know what to do. Grab a beverage or a snack and settle in to listen to Costa and his amazing journey. Costa, thanks for coming on the show today. I'm so happy to meet you and I'm thrilled to have you here. Absolutely. This will be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm excited. We we went off on a nice tangent while we were warming up. So my cheeks already hurt from smiling so much. So I think it's going to be a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, before we dive in, I love to ask our uh, guests where they are in the world. So where are you located? I am in Melbourne, uh, Florida. So not the Australia one. There's one in Florida. We're about an hour south of Kennedy Space Center. Oh, very um, cool. So just moved here, actually, getting to know the area. Originally from New York City. Okay. Oh, big change then. Weather and surroundings and everything. Yeah, I came from New York down to outside of Tampa where I have family and then girlfriend and I moved across the state um, over the east side of Florida. So yeah, lots of sunshine. Lots of sunshine. Yeah. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, That's great. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I love sunshine. Uh, my daughter is getting ready to go to college in Boston and I'm already kind of letting her know that I probably won't visit in the winter. <laughs> she really needs me to bring her home. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's always fun to move. And, uh, you know, it sounds like it's it's a good move. You're close, pretty close to family, which is always good. Well, I'd love to hear about your journey. Like what brought you into entrepreneurship and anything else you want to share about your journey? Yeah, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My father, my mom were both immigrants. They came to New York, my mom for college and sort of chasing my dad a little, I suppose. I don't, I don't think I know the full story there. Um, my father, uh, he was looking for his dad who had left Greece, um, found him in New York and they started doing just kind of repairs and maintenance, just little jobs here and there in buildings. They, they'd both been builders back home were four or five generations of, of builders construction workers, et cetera. And they eventually built a company, my father, his brother, and their dad, my grandfather. And they did interior renovations in Manhattan. And because they were doing maintenance and just very well for very wealthy clients, like they're doing little odd jobs at first, but their clients were really wealthy. And so little odd jobs turned into um, really big renovations, like multi-million dollar renovations. They made architectural digest. Um, before the business closed out and then they wrapped their, their careers up. Um, yeah. And the fun little entrepreneurial lesson there is if, if you want to do super high end work, you have to kind of start with that audience, with that market. You don't really get to change markets later. That's a much harder move. So if you start out like doing home repairs and home building in like, uh, a certain neighborhood, like in low end neighborhoods in terms of real estate, then moving to high end is a really hard move. It's just a different network of people that you're selling to. Um, so fun little entrepreneurial lesson. So I grew up around entrepreneurship. It's kind of always been around me. Um, my brother's an entrepreneur. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I've also done, I've never sort of held a corporate job, but I have done sort of independent contractor, um, hired as a project manager. That's my typical um, sort of work is getting hired to do project management specifically for me in the innovation space. So I get hired when someone's trying to make change. So that's my sort of background. Very cool. So when you say in the innovation space, are you saying particular to like tech or just any kind of change making? Yeah. So definitely not just tech. Um, we've done work with large tech companies. We built an innovation tournament inside of a large tech company as a training vehicle. Uh, they now do all their training that way. They cut yes. us out at some point in the process. They're like, apparently hey, we, did, we got this. <laughs> yeah, apparently we did a good job on the design side. So they kept our our design. So yeah, in, in terms of the innovation space, what we really mean here is helping people use creativity to solve problems. At the mm-hmm. end of the day, innovation breaks down to specifically that. You use creativity to solve problems. And the reason to do that is because in a large organization that has known customers, who buy a known product, you're a giant machine. It's about productivity and efficiency. How many outputs can you create with a given set of inputs? How efficiently can you do that? Can you push risk all the way out, et cetera? In our world, because things change so fast um, and so much, that's no longer enough. You either have to weather the disruption that comes into the marketplace. So all of publishing went online over the course of a decade. And if you were a local newspaper or a local magazine, you had to figure out how to cope with that. Or you're on the leading edge, not the receiving end. Um, So you're leading the change and creating change in the world and disruption and so forth. Um, So regardless of where you stand, you have to deal with this rapidly changing environment. And so in all that, the, the need for people to be able to think creatively, think on their feet, adapt, improvise, develop new projects, new products, brand extensions, massive cost reduction operations, all of that started to bubble up and become really necessary. So IBM in their study of CEOs in 2010 penned that creative leadership, creativity and leadership was the most important trait. So that was 2010. It must have already been happening for another decade, let's say, if they were studying it then. And I'd say if you look back further and try to do a historical analysis, I bet you'd still find huge aspects of change being really necessary. So I don't mean to say that this is entirely something new, but technology certainly does accelerate this kind of process. 
Yeah, I think that's interesting what you said about just the rate of change is something that we all need to be able to cope with. And when I think of innovation, I often think of like technology or, or environmental type things, but it's also just within the context of your business structure, for example, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if we zoom all the way out, so what is innovation? Innovation is just a word we use like any other word. So you got to, you get into definitions. So we use that word when we're talking about something that's new and valuable. So if it has elements of newness and elements of value, we begin to call it innovative, right? We accept that an iPhone is more innovative than a ham sandwich, right? A ham sandwich, is done <laughs> and it's just a ham sandwich. Unless there's something really unique and tasty about that ham sandwich. And that's, that's unique is the new factor. Tasty is the valuable factor when it comes to food. So that's an innovative ham sandwich. You could have an innovative ham sandwich. It would just have to be really new and interesting and be really valuable, really healthy or really tasty. So that's the word we use. So those are the two components. We also use the word innovation when we're talking about the process that results in those new and valuable outcomes. So if we're just trying to strictly come to a definition, that's it. Novelty plus value or the process that leads to novelty plus value. Those processes, you, it could be as simple as a one person innovation process in they're creating a new kind of website that serves a new function, one person operation, or we could be talking about the innovation systems inside of a really large healthcare company or a really large manufacturing company where sort of, um, you know, there's multiple tiers of processes and systems and people that interact to create new products. So that's what it means. And I think that you're right. Innovation doesn't have to be the big one. It can be the small one for entrepreneurs. It can be the structure of your business. If you're adapting structure, absolutely. It can be new products. If you're developing new products, it can be looking into new markets. It can be figuring out new ways to train employees that costs you less time and money. All of those meaningful changes. Um, if we move out of the business realm, you could talk about innovation or, or change in life. And you could be talking about developing healthy habits or teaching your kids responsibility uh, because all the expert books you read, none of that stuff worked because your kids are unique. And so you need to, to figure it out for yourself. And so you're innovating. That is so that's we, like textbook parenting right there. <laughs> Read yeah, the book if you like but, and good luck. <laughs> yep. It just in my experience. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. So you aren't necessarily industry specific then in what you do. Correct. We've done telecommunications, tech, uh, pharmaceutical, financial, and a variety of other ones. And then I do a whole lot of work in science. Actually, most of my mm -hmm. work is with NASA scientists, the National Science Foundation, different universities. The majority of my work is in sciences these days. And so we're, we're helping groups of scientists from across different scientific disciplines think in creative ways so they can generate interesting research ideas. Those research ideas then affect, you know, innovation probably half a century from now. So that's yeah. probably another piece of framework worth um, getting into. So when we talk about innovation at the societal level, so we talked about like everyday innovation that we all do. There's also sort of innovation at the societal level. And the way that works is scientists will develop new knowledge. They'll do research and they'll discover things about the way nature works, about the way the world works in some sense or another. And you don't need a PhD to do this. You don't have to like be credentialed. It doesn't matter. Many people do discovery in their day-to-day -day lives. Teachers are testing out new ways to teach their students live in the classroom. Without permission, they're just doing it and they should. Um, experimentation's great. We discovered new things about how the world works. Um, and that new knowledge that scientists develop gets handed to engineers. They use it to develop new technologies. And then entrepreneurs take new technologies to make new products and services. So the entrepreneur plays a pivotal role in this. We take new tech. Um, and we use it to make new products and services. Let's look at like digital cameras, for example. Uh, so camera technology used to be film exposure to sunlight, you know, cost a dollar or two dollars every time you click the button and snap a photo. So real scarcity around when you shoot the photo. Never mind you, an hour of development of those photos. I have a friend who's an expedition photographer. He was talking about the photographers in Antarctica half a century ago who they'd take like the garbage bags of their film and send it back to the mainland to get like 
uh, processed and, and they would never see a single photo they took unless it got published in, you know, the National Geographic or somewhere else. They wouldn't, they'd never see them. Yeah, exactly. So the. Think about the amount of gratification they were missing out on. <laughs> and now the tech, the, the tech has evolved tremendously. And along the way, entrepreneurs created like Instagram cannot exist unless the smartphone exists. So the entrepreneurs that built that company were leveraging the tech to create this new product or service of a marketplace, uh, you know, or a sharing platform where we could share photos with each other. Now they sold ads, et cetera. They have a business model, but there's 101 other things. I am like 95% ready for drone photography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not quite as a part of me that's still hesitant, but I'm fully expecting between artificial intelligence and digital cameras and drones, those three technologies intersect. At some point you should be able to hire you know, a photographer to run your wedding and they'll have one or two drones with them that'll fly around and get some interesting photos just kind of automatically. And that's like uh, part of, you think that will be like part of the standard package going forward? Yeah, like or that's an add-on or something. Yeah, it just seems like it's coming. Uh, yeah. And it's really hard to predict sometimes. It might be something totally different. Um, but again, so scientists, new knowledge, engineers take that, make new tech. And with new tech, entrepreneurs take that new technology, new capability, and they make new products and services. Um, and that kind of changes the world. That's, that's how the world changes in a technical sense. Never mind geopolitical, so just a whole separate category of stuff. Right. Um, in terms of culture and, and politics. But in terms of the technical world, it changes with scientific discovery, new tech from engineers, and new products and services from entrepreneurs. I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurs is there's, the, I just think we're wired up in a way to find solutions or to find gaps in the market and fill them. And mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of creativity. You know, I think a lot of times sort of the standard thinking is that creativity means being in the arts, but not necessarily, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think if we never discovered anything more scientifically and if engineers never invented new technology, entrepreneurs would still have like decades of work to do. Yes. And just with current tech, just with current knowledge, we would have some, the world needs way more entrepreneurs than we have. Absolutely. Yeah. We say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. For anybody who's, you know, thinking about dabbling and coming out, come out. This is your, <laughs> oh, yes. this is your opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's so, this is what makes it so exciting. I think, you know, being, I work primarily with medical practices, so there's, a different kind of excitement, different kind of innovation in that area. But just thinking about entrepreneurship kind of on a spectrum of how many opportunities there are for people who just get an idea. You don't have to be funded. You don't have to be credentialed. You don't have to, you just have to figure out how to monetize. And then you go, the rest you figure out. I wouldn't recommend writing down your business plan on a bar napkin and quitting your day job necessarily, <laughs> yeah. but it's been done. <laughs> That's totally true. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the requisite advice here is, um, test early and often. Yeah. Right. Have an entrepreneurial yeah. go but test early and often. Yeah. Uh, um, with entrepreneurs, sometimes you, you have an idea you're so impassioned with that you kind of work on it until it's perfect in like four years and $400,000 later. You know, you expose your product to the first customer and, you know, they're kind of not as enthralled with it as you are. And then you get defensive and then you, <laughs> you yeah, you and have then, a very bad path. Yeah. And it feels like failure. And we think we, you know, we've been taught failure is actually bad. I think failures are great. Oh, yeah. But you don't want to wait four years and spend $400,000 to learn. I think, you know, that kind of goes back to the speed of change as well. Like, I guess it's different if it's something that requires a lot of time. And I don't know what that would be, but, you know, maybe some science. I don't know. You know, yeah. there are certain entrepreneurial endeavors where you could assume the market will buy it. So, for mm -hmm. example, if you made a better energy storage system, so the current batteries do X, if you could do 10X, then yeah, people are going to buy. There's no reason not to. It's, you know, it's just, it's better than what we have for a lower cost. So that's a no brainer. That's totally fine. I, I think you can get in the lab until you make that discovery or you, you make that improvement. But then there are products where, you know, you really want to know if the marketplace wants the thing. So for example, writers, and, and a lot of times it's not even the marketplace, the thing. 
So writers, for example, are content creators of a variety of different kinds. A lot of entrepreneurs these days are just content creators. There's a finding your voice thing, and then there's a finding your audience thing. And so both of those require a conversation with the marketplace. Um, and so let's say you're, you're doing activist music. You have some sort of activist background, you're passionate about some particular issue. And so you, you create music for that community. Um, and at first the people don't really like it. And it's like, you're, you're finding your niche in that community. So maybe it's not the really serious high strung people in that particular niche of activism. Maybe it's the like grassroots, super young, like, and you know, more gritty part of that community that's going to really love your music. Actually, maybe they want it to be even more edgy um, or the reverse that it's going to be like a church going button up a little bit more serious kind of. And so that experimental process of like, take your content or your product and expose it to potential users, potential customers, um, see what they like, don't like, adapt a little bit more. That iterative process of developing your product market fit is the go-to phrase, mm -hmm. um, is really key. And, and I think the habit that's under that is test early and often. Mm -hmm. I love that too. And you use the word iterate, which I'd like to kind of piggyback on that and re-highlight that. Cause I think for our listeners, a lot of entrepreneurs get really starry eyed and we might be a little prone to what I call the SOS syndrome, shiny object syndrome, squirrels and shiny objects. And we might sometimes, even though we're expansive thinkers, sometimes get a little stuck in some black and white thinking. So if something doesn't work, we think, oh, and usually it comes back to some weird shame loop that we need to work on, right? But like, um, or not weird, but just a shame loop. Like, oh, I must not be good at this. It must be something that I've done wrong or whatever. And it's not, a lot of times it's a small tweak. And so, you know, if I think back over time for even some of my clients whose businesses on paper look about the same, the way that they've iterated certain things they've done or there's certain processes, even the way my business looks today compared to almost 12 years ago when I started, mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. Even from six months ago, my business looks really different because we've been testing and making small changes and doing some adjustments. And so I think that that's really important to keep in mind that you, you might try something and you don't have to make a massive shift. You might just try tweaking one little thing and then testing it and tweaking again and testing it. And you can do that in many ways, but, you know, collect your data. Don't make an assumption that it's not going to work just because you tried it one way and it just didn't work. Is it, sometimes it's the small adjustments and like, I'm not a huge fan of Tony Robbins, but one of his analogies has always stuck with me. It's like you used a golfing analogy of like, you're going to hit the ball, but if you adjust your body, just like one millimeter, it's the difference of the ball going straight out into, I don't know, the water or a slight adjustment and it curving off to the end and going out to, onto the green where you need it to go. Not a golfer, so I hope I got my terminology right. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, the point is, it's like the tiniest little shift, if you look at the longer and the bigger picture, can make a huge difference of where you're headed. So we don't have to change something completely. It's like one small iteration. Yeah, right? absolutely. So... I'm a huge fan of Robbins, so I'll, I'll be, I'll be double the fan. So. Yay. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so let's unpack the, the golf thing or let's translate it. So let's go to entrepreneurship and say, okay, you get one lifetime and let's say in your lifetime as an entrepreneur, you have about 2000 hours in a year of good, hard work. And let's say you get 30 good years and you'll have others, but let's say it's 30 good years. So you get 600,000 hours of hard work. And so if you put them all in upfront and you spend all 600,000 hours developing the product and then you launch it, well, you, that ball could go in any direction. Who knows what's going to happen? Whereas if you, um, if you spend 600 or if you spend 60 and then you hit the ball, like tap, you go, Oh, that went further left than I thought it would. Okay, well, 60 more hours and hit a hard tap. Oh, okay, that went off to the right. Okay, well, 60 more hours. Went. Okay, ooh, that's pretty good. That's like within the range I want. It's, that's within these 45 degrees. Let's do 60 mm -hmm. more hours an hour to here. And so the amount of precision you get by doing iterative development, by building a little, testing a little, building a little, testing a little, building a little, testing a little, the amount of accuracy that you get is tremendous. Here's why you want accuracy. 
because developing a business is a search operation. When you start as an entrepreneur, you do not have a functioning business model. Mm -hmm. You don't have known customers. You don't you have no idea who your customers are. And if there are any, um, you don't know why Usually they buy your product because <laughs> none are buying. And if some are buying, you still don't know why they're buying because you maybe haven't asked them yet. You're working, you're in the dark. You you have zero information. You are undergoing a search operation. You are searching for a business model. Business models have lots of parts. And for each individual part and that part's connection to other parts, you need to get real precise. What you are building when you build a business model and when you are searching for a valid hypothesis, a valid problem solution fit, product market fit, and erecting a business model is you are searching, you're, you're building a machine and each part has to perform exactly right because the outputs of this part go into the inputs of the other one. So for example, your marketing campaigns need to produce leads that your salespeople can take, make use of and sell goods that then your delivery team can actually follow through on the promises made by the salespeople and have happy customers so they come back and ask for more. That whole system needs to work. And so you need precision. You need tremendous precision. And if your iteration loop, if if you only iterate once, you're just you're you're paying huge upfront costs and then you don't know which direction that ball is going to move in. Whereas if you do the iterative development, if you work a little bit test, work a little bit test, work a little bit test, build a little bit test, build a little bit test, you get more and more and more accurate on each individual component of your business model. And like, you know, if I were to ask entrepreneurs, how many components are there in your business model? Like how many, how many parts are there to your business? How many moving parts? They might scratch their head and go seven, three, five. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me. And it's like, well, if I were to ask an engineer, how many moving parts they have in their internal combustion engine, they'd give me a number. They'd have a very, hey, very precise seven, number. And yeah. parts like we know yeah. this because they all have to perform exactly right. right. There's no reason entrepreneurs can't lift their standards to the same level. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to, there's some wiggle room. I don't mean to take this metaphor to the extreme. There's probably some wiggle room around marketing sales and, you know, this campaign worked last year. We're trying something new this year because we're being creative and artistic, totally valid. I don't mean to force everyone to be an engineer, but you could wear that hat and you could take seriously the idea of iterative development and you could build a really precise, measurable business model. And that'd be really powerful. Um, yeah. And it's more scalable when you have that, right? You need a system in place and you need to be able to measure the results you get. And when, you know, up to a certain point, this is something I find with my clients, up to a certain point, there's like three times in which the business demands that they up-level everything, their leadership, their systems, their, it might be their tech, it might be something, you know, some level of their business has to, or some portion of their business model needs to be up-leveled in order to sustain mm -hmm. growth or to continue to, to scale. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs who start their businesses on an idea of something, even if it's a really technical thing, sometimes approach the business itself as a creative thing. So I love this point that you're making that, no, we don't have to be engineers. I like to say like, you know, follow your heart and then bring your logical brain right beside you. And if that's fatiguing to you, hire someone who can do that and inform you of those things because you need that. We all need that. Like my assistant and then I have, I outsource tech. Those people manage all the small details for me because if I get stuck in that, I'm just, I lose all of my energy, but I need to know what those are. I just don't yeah, need to absolutely. manage them. So I think that that's, that's a really, really important piece to this. And mm -hmm. the other thing that really, that came up for me when you were talking about the iterative process is I think it also helps us develop our personal resiliency. We're building it inside of the business, right? If we're doing an iterative process and we're gathering data and we're making adjustments, but also personally, I think it helps us grow. And the more we're able to make adjustments, or I call them course corrections, like constant course correction, puts us in a position to be able to grow with our business instead of having it be shocking. Because there are periods of like, for many businesses, this has happened to several of my clients, like exponential growth. And all of a sudden they're like, holy long streak of blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. What am I doing? I think I might have to sell this thing, right? And I know that that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs if they haven't prepared themselves mentally also for that kind of growth. So I feel like it's like this nice tandem growth opportunity for the business and for the founder. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think you're the combination between the, the, the sort of mechanical precision and metrics and, and tech side and the creative inventive uh, side. I think if you can combine those, you can build something really powerful and you can be totally ready to scale when it comes because mm-hmm. uh, you'll know it's coming one, because you're measuring. Um, right. And then two, because there's a, so I take innovation down to five habits. So there are five foundational habits uh, for innovation. I teach these. The, we talked about test early and often. Another one, if you are handling massive exponential growth that showed up without warning or with warning is uh, be ready to improvise. Um, so adaptation and improvisation and that artistic sort of more musical sort of that, that side of the brain way better at adaptation. And so when you hit a moment where there's more scale than you can handle or a uh, COVID shows up, everything goes virtual and you know, all your sales vanish. So the opposite problem, too much scale, not enough scale, et cetera. Um, then you, that, those are moments when you need to think on your feet, adapt quickly, um, improvise, deal with reality as it is, instead of how you wish it were, um, <laughs> then you, you really need that artistic mind to come back and, and help imagine a new way. Just to cover the rest, come up with lots of ideas. Um, and I'd love to teach that one. I could probably teach it within the podcast if you'd like. Another one is give feedback to improve ideas um, or use feedback to improve ideas if you're the recipient and ask the right questions. So if you're not asking the right questions in the first place, it doesn't matter how creative, innovative, how epic your brainstorming is. You're, you've started with the wrong starting point. You need to be able to ask the right questions. Love that. So you said you you thought that you could teach about coming up with lots of ideas. I'm curious about this too, because I think for the for the um, smart but scattered, <laughs> there's there, there's a lot of temptation to go down rabbit holes there. So I'm I'm, I'm curious personally. I'm sure our listeners listeners will appreciate it. Absolutely. So so let's do fun little exercise. It, I, let's do ideas for superpowers. Imagine three superpowers. Hold up three fingers, and let me know when you've got them. Okay. And if you're listening at home, you can follow along. Three fingers, three superpowers. Okay. All right. So I'm going to name a bunch of superpowers. If I name one of yours, you got to put one of your fingers down. Okay. So, all right. Flying, super speed, super strength, reading minds, breathing underwater. Uh, did I already get it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's finish. I guess breathing. I'm not that creative. <laughs> breathing underwater, communicating with animals, walking on, walking through walls, climbing on walls. I used to do this list off the top of my head and some are escaping me, but there's a, you know, a list of super common superpowers. So what does it mean? It means when you ask the mind a question, it just reaches for what's easily available. It goes, oh, stuff I saw in Marvel movies, things I read in comic books. Those are your first ideas. And when you think about how to solve a business problem, your mind's doing the same thing. It doesn't suddenly go, oh, this is important. I'll use the novel part of my brain. Your brain doesn't know how to do that. It just automatically does the cheapest thing first. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do, the reason to come up with lots of ideas is because the really good stuff is past the really typical stuff. Now, that said, there are going to be situations where the typical answer is perfectly suitable. We don't always need massive imagination. It's really useful. In certain circumstances, if you're going to lunch, you don't need a thousand ideas of what you're going to eat for lunch. Just go to lunch. It's fine. (laughs) And then, but if you were starting a restaurant, you might want a thousand ideas on what could be on the menu. And you might want to take the most interesting of those, you know, and workshop them with the chef and come up with a really interesting menu. Uh, Why? Because in a list of a thousand, you're really likely to find some really good ones in there. So Larger list of ideas, more likely to have good ones. But it's even better than that. As you force your mind to generate more ideas, it starts to think in more original, more creative, more novel ways. Because you're persistently asking it to. It just draws on better resources. And so we did a test recently. We did an event with the National Science Foundation. Uh, They were working on non-coding RNA. There's a chunk of our DNA, all animals, DNA. It, uh, we don't know what it does. It's sitting there. It doesn't code for proteins. We're, we're still learning sort of what that component does. Anyway, this was, they're generating research ideas on this one. We color coded their post-it notes. They generated about 180 research ideas. And then we looked at which ones made it to the next round. 
So which ones were deemed really good by this group of scientists? And it turns out the highest concentration of good ideas came at the very end of their brainstorming. Um, the ideas that came from like the last one quarter of the ideas, um, one in four of those made the cut. Hmm. For the rest, it was like one in 12, one in eight, something like that. And this is typical. We see this in a lot of the consulting work that we do, that the ideas that come later in the process are more likely to be high impact, valuable, interesting, um, and ultimately succeed. So that's the, the principle of, that's the habit of come up with lots of ideas. And this is a habit of lots of great innovators. If you look at Picasso, Picasso made 40,000 works of art in his lifetime. I could be off by, by I think it's 40,000. It comes out to something like two per day. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh my God, like it's a lot of art. No, it's a lot of art, yeah. Yeah, and so among that, like, yeah, there are some masterpieces, like absolutely, because mm-hmm. there's just so much volume and he got better as he went. So there's a higher, probably a higher concentration of masterpieces toward the end of his career. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd have to, you know, have to go to an art historian to really understand that. Right. Um, so that's come up with lots of ideas. I think there's so much to that. You know, I'll, I will encourage my clients mm-hmm. early on when we're getting to know each other and trying to decide, you know, what is your big goal or what is your vision of success? That is our longest appointment of all the times that we get together, unless we do like a VIP day or something, but just a regular coaching session. And it's always, I always tell them it's, if you're going to journal, if we're going to brainstorm, if we're going to do anything, we're going to go until you think you've run out of ideas and we're going to ask what I call the awe question and what else. And we're going to ask that Mm. question until you um, start to feel like you don't like me at all and you never want to see me again because that's where the gold is. So when we get, I love that, we get to the outside edge of our regular thinking and then we push. And yeah, that's, I was thinking about this, like if we do that on a regular basis, how much more innovative we can be and how much more we might find solutions for those of us who are entrepreneurs and we're usually solution providers of some kind, find more solutions or maybe better or more efficient or whatever solutions for our clients and customers problems or challenges. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. I love that too. Like that just like, just a, that was a big aha for me. <laughs> and, and it ties in, right. It ties into all the other things that we've been talking about that, you know, innovation is something that needs to be unique, but it also needs to bring value. I believe you said so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Absolutely. So I, we're coming close to the end of our time. I am just very curious if you could just tell us a little bit about um, something that struck me is your your work with NASA on life outside of Earth. What? <laughs> yeah, so, so we we cur- so by life here we don't you know everyone's well, little green men. It's like oh no, uh, yeah whatever little green men. <laughs> yes, um, life forms right. At least I don't have you know government clearance or anything like that. So if there is right. above my pay grade, so I'm right. not aware outside of the uh, top <laughs> secret secret. Yeah. <laughs> so we're working with astrobiologists. We're working with academics largely. And so when they look for life beyond Earth, they're looking for signs of uh, microscopic single cell organisms, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, our only example is Earth, you know, Earthling life. So it becomes a really difficult question. It's like, wait, how do we look for life out there? So and what, we did this workshop. We did a bunch of these. One was around networking within the scientific community. Another was around something else. But the one that I'm thinking of and, and is in the, um, uh, the written material that I put out is around reimagining the search for life beyond Earth. I think it happened in either 2016 or 2014. I don't remember the date. Um, and it was a group of astrobiologists. And up until then... The, the normal for search for life beyond earth was that using our telescopes and using probes that get sent up, et cetera, to look for signs of life that would be like us. Mm-hmm. So we're looking for oxygen rich atmospheres. We're looking for a certain distance from a star, uh, the sort of Goldilocks parameters. Uh, we're looking for liquid water on the surface and we're looking for these things because, well, intuitively we went, there's life. Let's go look for it. What does life need? Life needs water, oxygen, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that's what we need. Mm-hmm. Um, in theory, there could be life that looks nothing like us. That's totally different. 
And so this workshop um, was run. So by the way, the, the organization that the science work happens through is called No Innovation, which is K-N-O-W Innovation. Um, so that's our sister company, really awesome work. And there's a gentleman who spoke at this event named Lee Cronin. He was on the Lex Friedman podcast recently for about four hours. So if this is really interesting to you, feel free to check that out. Go, also, go geek out. <laughs> oh, okay. He was also on the New Innovation podcast with me. Uh, so happy to share a bunch of links. Um, yes, please. The idea that Lee brought to the event and shared and was also being asked for in a certain kind of way is what bundle of like, can we run statistics? Can we look at um, emergent features of life? And can we run a statistical model to see if you reach a certain quantity of indication, can you start to say, hey, we're getting a flag here. Like, go look closer at this place hmm. or this region or where this probe is looking. So the idea that Lee Cronin brought in, he's published recently, it's called assembly theory. And so he was looking at chemical complexity as a biosignature. So he's saying, if you look at chemistry, the chemistry that comes out of purely physical processes, a volcano, the sun, depending on your definition of life, these are not living processes, they're just physics. These are just physics processes. The stuff that comes out of a nuclear reactor, all those chemicals are somewhat simple. Even crystals, crystals formed from physical processes, they're large molecules, but it's the same very basic pattern repeating again and again. Whereas if you find a molecule that's really complicated, Viagra was his example, because it's hilarious, um, is actually a quite complicated molecule. There's a lot of different elements and some unique arrangements. It wouldn't just bubble up out of a volcano. If you went to Mars and dug up some dirt and you found a bunch of Viagra in there, you'd go, uh, what, like that? <laughs> what happened? Like, what did, did NASA send this here? Right. What, that's the idea. And if you need an extreme example of that, you'd say, okay, if you went to to Mars and you dug up in the dirt and you found an iPhone, you just found an iPhone in the dirt on Mars. Like, you know, we all know intuitively that didn't just randomly come together because the dust stirred a particular way on the red right. planet. Like, no, that yeah. came from us. Like it's, it's undeniable because that molecule, the, 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 the iPhone itself or set of molecules, whatever, it's so big, so complex, so indicative of us. And so it's like, okay, well, somewhere between single atoms and an iPhone, there's a line and you could say, Hey, there's a threshold somewhere. And if we're above that threshold of chemical complexity, we could start to say, well, something living probably made it mm -hmm. because the energy cost of complex chemistry is so high. Someone would have had to pay that cost. And in order to pay that cost, you'd have to have some value and like volcanoes and suns and physical processes just don't that don't operate the way life does. So that's the idea. Lee Cronin is the, the source to sort of learn more about that. But what we're doing in our work is we're helping people think creatively so they can, they could get to those kinds of places. Um, and sometimes it's lone wolf, someone sort of generating ideas like that on their own. This is your Einstein character or Lee potentially is one of these. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's a group thing. You have 30 scientists in a room for a week and these ideas come out of their conversations with one another. So that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. We help people use their creativity to solve wicked hard problems. And in all my time doing that work with scientists, with businesses, it's become pretty obvious to me that innovation and creativity are not just for people with shiny laboratories and big budgets. They're for all of us. We all have problems we care about where a little bit of imagination could go a long way in helping solve them. Um, so I've become quite passionate about that. And we put out an innovation 101 course it's in development now. So it's early bird discount at the moment, if that's something that's interesting to you. And I'm, I'm really passionate lately about getting these skills to entrepreneurs and small business owners, to parents trying to teach their kids healthy habits and anywhere else that this stuff is applicable. Love that. Oh my gosh. We'll make sure that we get all the links so we can share all of this in the show notes. And so at time of airing just scroll down in, this, in the show notes and be able to click on there so you can go and learn more. I mean, this is so, I love this work. I mean, I appreciate science. It's never been a strength of mine, but I'm always fascinated with how, you know, 
how people create, how they invent, how all these things, especially in the very linear or maybe not so linear world of science. But I, I love how it's applicable really to anything. It's just so cool. So with that, I would love to ask, what would be the first place that people should go and look for you? Um, so uh, innovationbound.com is my company, innovationbound.com slash 101 is the 101 course. And then we're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, if you're looking for me, that's at ideas and action. Gotcha. And that's on Instagram mostly. And if you're interested in free diving, you'll see a whole bunch of diving content. Um, we're doing an executive course called Finding the Wild Within. We're super excited for this. Ooh. We want to take executives yeah, to a free diving situation, teach them how to do breath hold diving. Um, which will be a ton of fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Talk about pushing more to come. too. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, very exciting. Oh, well, I'm just, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Last Absolutely. question. Do you have any parting advice that you'd like, if you could impart just one or two things to our listeners? Yeah. That's the right way to say this. Uh, be courageous. Our times are strange to say the least. Though we live in a period in history that's getting real weird, real fast, or, you know, weird to say it lightly, be courageous. The world needs your most courageous self now. Mm. Um, and I'm not speaking to extremists of whatever variety you are from. You need to sit down. Um, yes, please. But yeah, people who are sane and rational and, and, you know, whatever you want to call it, who are out to add value and help build meaningful institutions, our institutions are falling apart. Basically, um, the fourth turning is the, um sort of go-to uh, book on this subject. There's a bunch of others. There are a bunch of historians talking about this. These are long-term cycles and we are at the part that gets really, really challenging and we need people to be courageous. That's all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Oh my gosh. Get a little bit of chills. Wrote down the book. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming on today. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, we'll stay in touch. And uh, for our listeners, make sure you scroll down and click on all the links that we'll be sharing because I think there's a, some pretty fascinating rabbit holes to go down. <laughs> you are very, very welcome. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Entrepreneur Mindset Reset. Be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll never miss a show. As you know, reviews are what help your fellow entrepreneurs find the right podcasts for them. So please leave us a review and tell your friends about us so more people can hear the valuable information we share in each episode. If you are a medical practice owner and you're struggling with overwhelm from the daily business operations and decisions and trying to manage your time and all that juggling, schedule a talk with me by visiting my website at tracycherpesky.com forward slash medical hyphen practices. Link is in the show notes. We look forward to hearing from you and celebrating your success.